And have you ever had preconceived standards for brands that get shattered after testing? Harry, read us your notes. I know you've got notes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is No Putts Given, episode number 84. We've got Harry, Tony, and Chris here to break it all down today. Guys, um, how are we doing? And most importantly, did everyone see the eye roll heard around the world? Yeah. It was fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, it's like, it's there's so many memes that have come out of it. I don't Ugh. think I've ever even eye rolled that hard at you before. Oh, no, you oh, have. I, I bet you have. Like, that was that was personal. I would throw out an offer to Brooks Bryce, and I can help mediate, you know, again, having taught middle school and having seven daughters, I'm actually an <laughs> expert in huh. petulant, childish, immature behavior. Um, and so <laughs> I am great at dealing with 12-year-old girl behavior, which I think is kind of right where we're at at this point. So I'll throw the offer out there. I'm good to go. I loved it. I thought it was great. Do it, you guys it, think it, it's real? Like, I think I, it's player impact program. I think they're trying to get that $40 million. It's like $8 million bucks for first prize, right? I don't know. I think Brooks has been trolling Bryson for a while now with the ant comment. It felt very personal to me. <laughs> I have a hard time thinking that it wasn't real. But anyway, uh, made my week. Let me know. I'm available. Get your popcorn. All right. So let's get into the mashed potatoes of this week, if you will. Mashed potato! Uh -huh. Last week, we put out an article on Cobra's two new putter lines, a 3D putter line and a King Vintage putter line. So if you haven't seen that article, go check it out. But we're going to break it down here for you. Tony, how long has it been since we've seen putters from Cobra? Well, I couldn't I couldn't tell you the exact date. Oh, uh, come on. That's why I have you here. I know. The last time I recall, they had, you remember the Bobby Gray series? Yeah. Chris, I'm, I'm sure I remember. Yeah. Like, well, it's been a long, long time. I mean, I think probably when they were still a, a sister company with Titleist, pre-Puma days. Oh, really? Greg Norman may have still been on Cobra staff at that point. Yeah. <laughs> like, Shit. Well, he, he's, an he's back again, right? So, yeah, you know, full kinda... circle. <laughs> so give me like a, a a ballpark, like two decades, three decades. Uh, yeah, plus or minus 15. Yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. 15 years. Okay. Excluding box set putters. They they do stuff these putters <laughs> in their box sets. They certainly didn't hold back. They didn't launch just one, but two lines. And there's a number of putters in each of them. So why now, do you think? You know, a couple things. One, if they want to differentiate themselves in that space, right? They're thinking, okay, how can we do something differently? What's the next great leap if there is one in, um, you know, equipment? It's going to be with manufacturing techniques and or materials, if anything, and we see this in our surveys all the time, people associate you know Cobra as a company that is really technologically driven and innovative, um, and they are, and they probably don't get enough credit for that sometimes. I think this is just part of what they're doing is looking for ways to continue to push those boundaries and looking at you know the the opportunities present with three D printing. You know there are some significant advantages. So you have that on one side, then you have a staffer like Bryson on the other who is you sick uh, S I K, not like ooh crazy sick putters, bro, but like sick putters. Um, and so there's an opportunity for some collaborations with a slightly smaller brand that's probably looking to get bigger. And so there's just a couple of those factors in there that made, you know, made an awful lot of sense. Sick weren't that big. They only had Bryson on their staff for the most part. I think it was a smart move by them at the end of the day, because Sick Golf have proven themselves in testing. And at the end of the day, I think Cobra was like, well, we, the only one that was really missing out of our lineup is a putter. So it was. I thought. I thought it was a good collaboration, and I think it's a smart move by them. Sick kind of fit the same philosophy as Cobra with the look and feel kind of vibe throughout the company. I remember being at the PGA show, and they came up to us with their big hats on and like flat caps, and I was like, "That's that's Cobra esque somewhat." Chris, you mentioned that they're very dedicated to technology and innovation. So why don't we start with the three D putter line? And Tony, it's a unique type of 3D printing, right? They're using nylon? Yeah, it's uh, so if you go back to the, the limited edition one that came out a few months ago, that was HP Metal Gent printing where they essentially printed, the body was, was made from a printed material. Here they're, they're using these, yeah, it's, it's a nylon type material to, to print inserts. 
So it's not really as, as robust an implementation of 3D printing as, as kind of the limited edition one, but it's, it's sort of unique, right? And it does have some advantages around saving weight and, and things like that. So going back, I mean, four or five years plus, I've been talking to those Cobra guys saying, hey, when are you going to release a putter? What are you doing? Because I'd go out there and right, I'd play with these box set putters. And so every year I'd be like, is, is, is there actually going to be one? You know, they were very consistent in the message that said, we're, we're not going to release a putter just to, just to say we have one. You know, as Chris mentioned, Cobra, Cobra is one of the more innovative companies and, and having technology like this that nobody else has right now is, is kind of a statement piece as much as it is anything else that, that allows us to say, hey, we're, we're, pushing, we're pushing the envelope. We're doing something that nobody else is doing. And I think the sick face that they're using, uh, licensing that technology from sick putters is, is probably as much a part of the story as well. That was my next question. What kind of competition do they have in the 3D printed putter world? Are they the first? Where do they stand there? Yeah, right now it's it's just them. Yeah, yeah. So it's the future, in my opinion. I think we'll see a little bit more three D printers coming out because it's so easily done. I mean, you you're like, all right, what design do I want to do? And then they just throw it into a three D printer and be like, oh shit, this works. So other than being like a cool talking point, right? Like, okay, yeah, it's something we do that nobody else does. What's the benefit? A lot of the the real benefit is in rapid prototyping. Hey, we've got this idea. We want to see what the shape looks like, how this plays out. Let, let's print one up, right? And then obviously the other piece, like we said, it's weight savings. With traditional methods of, of building golf clubs, you're sort of limited to by what molds allow you to do, right? So you can't right. have like these, these large voids in your material. So if you look at you know, the, the, the innards of these, especially the mallet putters, you see like this intricate cage structure. You couldn't do that if you were just trying to, right. to cast into a mold, right? This this three-dimensional, almost elliptical kind of cage structure. Looks like a spider web. Yeah. It's like a lattice. Yeah, like you have. There you go. <laughs> you can't create those structures if you're you're pouring metal into a mold. What about the price of it? Is it cheaper? No, it's, it's priced like a camera. It's expensive. No, I'm like to make, like to 3D print. So are their margins higher? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I would assume, you know, there's, you, you have to make money, right? So they're... <laughs> right, that's my guess is like, they're probably a little bit cheaper as well. And you can, you can bang them out pretty quick. I don't know. In theory. Potentially. Here's another question for you. When I think about 3D printing, and, and I'm sure there's other people think, you like, you think like these little plastic things, maybe one of your kids brought home from school because the school got a 3D printer and it's like, oh, look, I made... Our video guy 3D prints all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's like, oh, I made this little figure of you know, a garden gnome out of plastic or whatever, <laughs> right? Oh, did that make okay. that? Okay, yeah. So it's like, I think some people think of 3D printing as like this really like rudimentary kind of rough process, but then you're saying like, oh, they, they're using nylon and I'm thinking, you know, like camping is it tents clothes? and like Tarps different. And, yeah. yeah, so like <laughs> my question is like, what's the, what's the theoretical limitation on what type of materials can you use carbon can you use composites can you obviously use plastics can you use like really fine metals and things and can you 3d print we should call a scientist you know i have no idea well i mean we know they did some some metal jet printing right so right. you can you can print metal you can obviously print nylons and plastics and things like that and i, I would assume you're going to see progress to you know applications for just about any material that you would want to use I mean, does this then leak over potentially? Like if there's any credence to what Harry's saying about, okay, is this a future type of process? Like, you know, could a 3D printed driver head be have certain advantages over? So, yeah, I mean, that's been tried or, you know, been dabbled in. It's kind of an odd thing to say, but my favorite patent uh, <laughs> application that I've seen is <laughs> Ping has one for a, a driver that essentially has – like a, a lattice structure in the face. If you can take weight out of the face where, you know, it, it's a high concentration of mass in an area where you don't want it. Right. If you can take out some of that weight and put it in a useful place, that's, I mean, you're talking about the possibility of within today's world, pretty significant gains. You can't do that with casting. Yeah. Does anyone else have a um, favorite patent? Apart from my own, my own one that I haven't created yet, but yeah. You don't have a patent. Yeah, I do. 
All right, let's move on to the uh, vintage line. So uh, my question here is they've invested so much into being technologically advanced with the 3D putter line. Why bother with a vintage line? Cost. It's what people are used to and cost. I mean, you already have all the infrastructure set up to do that, right? So like, you know, something you'd have to think about with 3D printing and any of those, like if you want to do that on any type of mass scale, right, there's a lot of infrastructure requirements. The marginal cost to produce one more putter of a vintage putter has to be exceptionally low. And so, A, it's what people are used to, right? So there's going to be certain people who say, hey, I'm not so sure about this 3D thing. You know, I don't, you know, they're thinking it's some kind of like putt-putt golf mallet plastic thing, whatever I want something I'm comfortable with. And like I said, their cost for production, marginal costs and things like that, probably quite a bit lower. So those would be the two things that I would uh, assume are probably accurate. So even on the the vintage line, right, where you don't get the 3D printing technology, you still get that sick face. And I think it's a way to, to put that technology in golfers' hands at a more affordable price point and roll in some new shapes as well or, or different shapes. So you know, the, the heavy toe hang model. I think it's a 60 degree toe hang in uh, the Tony Covey in, model. Yeah, that so they don't they don't offer that in the 3D printed version at this time. And again, something like that putter. It's a case where if you if you 3D printed any part of that, you would just be doing it to say you did. There's probably not a, a ton of a ton of benefit in that type of shape. So so what are some of the specs on the vintage line that separates it from any other putters on the market? What makes them unique? Sick face. Sick. Okay. Yeah. And and I, I suppose the uh the Cobra specific Arcos embedded Lampkin grip. Yeah. Which is yeah. you know, it's kind of a surprisingly good grip, I think. I was surprised. I thought I when I saw it, I thought I was just gonna like all right, It's I'm a little slimy, you know? Slimy? Yeah. It's just slimy. Um yeah. Really quickly, right, on that sick face, I just have a random putter here. This is not a uh sick putter, it's actually a birdie ball putter. Um but on a sick putter, right, basically it has grooves that change the effective loft at different places on the face. So descending it's, it's loft. It's four, four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one from top to bottom. Basically, when you're putting, everyone has a different stroke, but you're going to be, it's guaranteed, well, in theory guaranteed, to launch at the same launch angle every single time, no matter if you hit it up on it, down on it, straight, whatever it is, it's going to be launching consistently. And we've seen it. Yeah, consistent launch regardless of delivery. That's yeah. that's the objective. Seems reasonable enough. Yeah. So, Harry, here's what the people really want to know. How did these putters do in testing? Because we didn't tell you, but we snuck them in there. We put the limited edition Super Sport 35 in the test, but we didn't publish the results. And that was 3D printed from top to bottom, yes? Yes. That's 3D. Kay. Yeah, that, that's the HP Metal Jet printed John Barber wrote an awesome story on the on the entire process. I'm sure Matt can do it there. Of we John can did. link that too. All right, Harry, how'd they do? It came seventh, right, in strokes gained from five feet. Third, strokes gained from 10 feet and seventh, strokes gained in 20 feet, allowing it to come third in the test overall. Third? Ooh, you just reminded me of a patent. The sticky notes. Three, <laughs> three M, three M. Post it. Yeah. See, it's not that you guys don't have favorite patents. It's just you've never thought about it. Before. <laughs> Third and total overall was actually really impressive for a putter that hasn't been on the market ever. From the f number one putter to the Cobra, it, it had twenty three putts more than the number one. Which over a test. What does that mean? Twenty three putts more. The most wanted winner put putter took a 703 shots over uh, 5, 10, and 20 feet. 726 was the Cobra. The less putts that you you have in a test, the better your putt is going to perform. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. So it, it, it performed really well, to be honest. So it's already been proven to do some magical stuff in magical. our testing. So we'll see what this new line comes out with in 2022. Did we check the mail? Yeah. <laughs> Mail it reminds me of that Blue's Clue song. So we got an awesome question this week from DMP327, and I want to see um, how your answers differ and what you guys come up with. Um, the question that we got in the mail this week is, do you ever have preconceived standards for brands that get shattered after testing? And he added, looking at you, Vokey Wedges. Who wants to start? 
Mm. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is, since we picked your question, my friend, we're sending you a Japanese head cover. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> so make sure, DM one of us your address, and if you'd like a, a limited edition Japanese head cover, it's on its way to you. Do we actually know if those are limited edition? <laughs> like, I, you know what? I, I'm down, it's the only one we know about. <laughs> I started at 84, and I'm down to 79, so it's limited. That's pretty Wait, limited. Wait, so you're just, you're just picking people to send yes. them to, right, Chris? I'm picking random... Uh, fans of my golf spy and sending them Japanese head covers. If I'm going to come to the Corn uh, Ferry Monday qualifier, yeah, I will be using one of those head covers for yeah. the tournament. Yeah, I've started putting <laughs> some of them randomly on people's bags at courses and just kind of watching what happens. Like, when they're not, <laughs> like I go and take their cover off and put it in their bag and then put one on and then I just kind of sit there and watch. Like, you just walk away, on? hide in a corner and see how it goes. Yeah. You know, it's very entertaining to me. So I should probably let uh, you guys in on that at some point. We should yeah. do more of that. That is, <laughs> that is brilliant. That's... These Putter covers are the gift that just keeps on giving. But anyway, you, you send knew. us mail. Chris sends you mail whether you want it or not. So, oh. again, the question, have you ever had preconceived standards for brands that get shattered after testing? Harry, read us your notes. I know you've got notes. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, guys. I am prepared to die. And you're the soft goods guy. So yeah. that's the world we're swimming in with you right now? Yeah, soft goods. Kay. So when it came to it, this company, which is Fitchoy, say that they're the number one best shoe in golf, best glove in golf. But after testing them, they're not quite there. Um, and that's in, in our testing. And then Nike shoes is the biggest one, all right? A lot of people think that Nike shoes are the bee's knees, they're the dog's bollocks. <laughs> they're not, guys. They're really good at making hype. But performance-wise, they suck. Nike's not a performance shoe, is what you're saying. It's it's more an apparel brand that it's a it's an apparel lifestyle. Hey, look at my shoes. That makes you look really cool, at least in the golf world, right? I'd argue it doesn't make you look cool at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like there's a lot of athletes that are going to come after us for this, but we're we're talking golf specifically, right, Harry? Yeah. Okay. So we don't know shoes... about the running shoes and and whatnot. Right. There right. Might right. Be this is just different. golf. Yeah. But this is just golf. So Nike just does not make a good shoe when it comes to golf. Now, hopefully, they're going to prove me wrong in the future. But at the moment, they are not. The interesting thing that I thought that was going to be absolutely bullshit is salted smart insoles. All right. I thought that that was going to come to the studio and be an absolute dumpster fire. And it was the complete opposite. It was actually phenomenal. All right, so that's that's that allows you to see your weight transfer and see when you're peaking in your vertical vertical force. And if you don't know what the salted smart insoles are, here's a link so that you can check them out. Read that yeah. article; they're pretty cool. Tony, what have you got? What has shattered your expectations, either in a good way or a bad way? I mean, it's like over the years, right? We've been, you know, if you count even like the smaller tests we did in the beginning, we've been doing this twelve years, and you know, a few things stand out. So let's say like the first bigger driver test we did you know, i think it was 10 testers this was the first time like we actually had to go out and recruit people versus just kind of people we knew from from the facility where we did our testing i just remember those guys were super jacked to hit the titleist driver i think it would be probably in the 913 at the time maybe the 915 like just super excited to hit it you know i got titleist ah! and you know they they hit it and you know reputation of titleist drivers at the time spinny short held up and those guys were like man disappointed by that dreams crushed absolutely mm -hmm. loved the the tailor made in the callaway i think that's a good example um i mean all ball lab just countless examples oh, man. over that's a and great, over a great again one. i mean just you know when we did the performance test with the robot and we had balls just flying way off line which one did you were you disappointed in I mean, look, the Chrome Soft, obviously, that was that was one that, that stood out where, you know, that was the ball that changed the ball, right? That was how it was hyped. And we're like, well, it did. Definitely not for the better. The opposite. Some of the MaxFly balls. That was one where I, I remember taking those out of the box with Sam thinking, you know, this Dick's House brand ball is, you know, this is almost a joke. And we're like, wait a minute. It's, it's long and it's straight. And it's, you know, certainly keeping up or outperforming. Kirkland, isn't that in the same kind of... Uh, I mean, the, the, Kirk, the Kirkland, I think, is a great example of getting exactly what you expected with the yeah, three-piece, okay. right? The four-piece, you know, we didn't get a chance to robot test that because it was out of production. The three-piece, you're like, all right, it's it's interesting, but it, it tends to fall out of the sky when it hits a little bit of wind. 
Um, and to speak to kind of the, the Vokey thing, I, I, you know, specifically that he mentioned, I wouldn't say we've been disappointed with Vokey. I think wet weather. Yes. But that's a lot of companies. Yeah. So v- Vokey will tell you that its advantage is in the grinds and what it's been able to do from a fitting perspective because of that. But with respect to that, do I sometimes shake my head when I see, you know, what Ping is doing with moisture management and what Mizuno has yeah. done with, with their grooves and, and channeling moisture and hydrophobicity. Yeah. To see kind of that stuff we see on the launch monitor in very specific wet conditions is go, you know, come on guys, like you're, you're the number one brand. You should be. You should be trying to do some of this stuff. You know, All right. Some disappointments, some shocks, some surprises. Yeah. Every every year. Very cool. All right, Chris, what has changed your preconceived notion of a brand or the idea of what you thought it should or how you thought it should perform? There's a long list, man. There's Give us the highlights. The highlights. All right. Highlight number one. I am shocked that no Japanese company has been able to figure out North America. Um, Ooh, okay. There's a blueprint there. Some have tried. Um, but really, ultimately, you know, you kind of go down the list. Um, you know, 14 Golf used to have a huge presence. Um, you know, Hanma Golf still has somewhat of a presence, although they're, a presence. <laughs> yeah, although they're in, in flux um, as they well. They are a company that currently exists. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> Epon, you know, to a degree, right? Um, you know, Mizuno, Mayura, you can make your different arguments there as to whether or not Mizuno is really a Japanese company. I was going to say, aren't they in Georgia? Well, so that's it. Well, (laughs) geographically speaking. (laughs) They really have three different heads. So, you know, they got a, they have an Asian, you know, Japanese centric part, Europe, and then, uh, then US. And and they, they do act similarly, you know, but differently. But I'm talking like, like a Mayura, Epon, Fujimoto, Hanma, Yamaha, Yonex, something like that. To really establish itself in the U.S., I I am shocked that nobody has been able to actually figure it out. Interesting answer. I like it. I would say something that surprised me in a positive way. You know, this was before any ball test. I was absolutely in the camp of, hey, it's a golf ball. It can't be that hard to make something that small. I remember Titleist would say things like, oh, well, it's about quality control. I thought there was a lot more hype and hyperbole and kind of pomp and circumstance um, around the company of of kind of that, you know, white coat laboratory. We're, you know, we're kind of for the better player type thing. And I didn't really believe it. I thought, eh, okay. But is it really worth that difference in price, this, that, you know? And here we are five, six Turns years later, out. and it's like, uh, yeah, I was wrong. Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's. Oh uh, shit! You started. You started on the ball talk. Yeah, I know. I'm cutting you off. Well, no, I just uh, want to talk like shit. this is. No, hear me out on this because this was amazing. Like the, I'll hear you out. They talk about expectations, right? We go into this robot ball test and we think, all right, tour balls. They all they all go the same difference, and we literally kind of joked, like, you know, what if we, if we put a bucket out there, right? right? At least half of the balls would land in it, right? And that and we. we figured out pretty quickly that they <laughs> they weren't going to. And so on the last day of testing, which was our 85-yard wedge shot, obviously you would expect tighter dispersion, less kind of variance, and, and more things right on top of each other. We're like, screw it. Let's literally put a bucket on the range. We'll hit a couple shots. We see where they're landing, and we'll put a bucket in that spot and see how many balls, as we go through the entire test at this distance, how many balls land in that bucket. Anybody want to venture a guess how many? One. Two. One. One. There's your winner, Chris. Yeah. All right, guys. Before we go today, on the count of three, I want everybody to tell me something that'll make me do a a Kepka eye roll. Ready? One, two, three. Haircuts are too expensive. Divorce. (laughs) No. Okay, fine. All right, guys, we're here every Tuesday. If you want to check out what we talked about last week, here's a link. Uh, We'll see you next week. Tony, where are you saving your money? What doesn't have to be the most top of the line? I mean, a putter, for sure. I mean, you can go back, I mean, how many decades, right, has the the shape of the putters that sell remained largely unchanged? And you're seeing a lot of just 